All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming to our season finale of Third Thursdays. And we have two fantastic guests, two friends of mine and friends of the gallery and friends of, uh, yeah, um, that, who I've shown here, uh, Aaron Turner and Wendell White. Um, Aaron, I see your name on screen is much longer. Do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just my full name, University okay, good. Account stuff. <laughs> All right, just want to make sure. <laughs> so uh, I'll read a little bit of their bios for an introduction. Aaron Turner is a photographer and educator currently based in Arkansas. He uses photography as a transformative process to understand the ideas of home and resilience in two main areas of the United States, the Arkansas and Mississippi Deltas. Aaron also uses the 4 by 5 camera to create still life studies on identity, history, blackness as material, and abstraction. Uh, Aaron received his MA from Ohio University and his MFA from Mason Gross School of the Arts in Rutgers. Uh, and he's had a, a lot of residencies and shows and um, Aaron helped create what was once known as the Center for Photographers of Color. And now the new name is Aaron. <laughs> oh, it's called the Center for Art as Lived Experience. Yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> name. The Center for Art as Lived Experience. It's a great name. Aaron also has his own podcast, uh, which will, he will be getting back to very soon. Uh, and then Wendell White. Uh, Wendell White uh, resume is too long, so I'm just going to uh, read a few things here. <laughs> There's no podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying. Not yet. <laughs> Uh, Wendell White uh, has his BFA from the School of Visual Arts, yay, SBA, and an MFA from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Wendell taught at the Photography School of Visual Arts, Cooper Union, uh, ICP, RIT, and is currently the Distinguished Press Professor of Art at Stockton University. His work has received various awards, really many awards and fellowships, including uh, the 2021 Robert Gardner Fellow in Photography, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography, Harvard University, uh, Simon Guggenheim, well, the Guggenheim Award Fellowship Award, uh, the Bunn Lectureship in Photography, Bradley University, three artist fellowships from the New Jersey State Council of the Arts, uh, photography grant from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in Fine Arts, and on and, and on and on. <laughs> he's in many, many collections, uh, and he's uh, amazing. So. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Wendell. Uh, Wendell will go first. I'm just going to make a few adjustments here on the camera, and then we'll start a Wendell show. Okay. And you, when, as soon as you're ready with the first slide. Yep. Yep. Great. Yep, yep. So just I'll start out um, while we're making the adjustments by saying um, how much I appreciate uh, the um, invitation to be here and to talk. And um, in particular, I was interested because I've also had a long-term um, admiration for Aaron's work, and we've crossed paths a number of times over the years, and it, it seemed like a wonderful opportunity to get to um, share our work in the same context, and that I was, was one of the real highlights for this, but also, of course, the wonderful relationship I've had with the JKC Gallery and Michael and all the things that have uh, been associated with it. So I um, couldn't think of a title for what I wanted to talk about today. So I just sort of threw a few things together in the sense of language that has had an impact on the way in which I've approached my work and the kinds of things that I've been doing. Um, and as a way of representing the fact that at this particular moment, there's a certain degree of transition which is taking place as I'm working on several projects simultaneously from which I anticipate there will emerge not just new, new projects but new ways of thinking about work that I've been doing for now more than three decades um, which is a little daunting even for me I always have to start out and go okay I started this project here and then that's another decade then that's another decade and so it it the time has really added up in terms of the work that has been specifically about African American life and black culture um, and it started in New Jersey um, and it has you know continued from there uh, we can go to the next yep. slide Be before we uh, keep going I just want to make sure can everyone hear Wendell okay on zoom it's okay. Yeah, good. Okay, good. <laughs> We've had that problem before. <laughs> okay. So um, 
the project that really started it all in which there are a number of different um, connectors that lead out to different aspects of my work is the Small Towns Black Lives Project. And we can go on for a slide or two here. And it is the project that really occupied my um, time and energy for a little over, almost a decade and a half, a little over a decade, uh, starting in the late 80s and going uh, right through to the beginning of the 2000s. And it represents, and we see here in this image in particular, um, not only the, the first image, which was a portrait and the conversations that I was having in the community. And I started this project with no intention of including text, but those conversations led to um, an understanding of an invisible world that was being described to me that I knew I wouldn't be able to photograph. And so I began telling the stories of the people that I connected with. And then um, I was able to also get a chance to connect with um, the idea of doing historical research. And so here, just about a year into the project, I came across the cemetery and began unfolding the narrative of a place where people no longer lived. And we can go on from here. The next slide. Yep. Thank you. And in in and amongst all of this, and this is one of the later images um, from that project, I was also looking at the built environment and the landscape that was a landscape that was occupied by African Americans throughout South South Jersey. So I started with this interest in portraits of the people that I encountered, but I also turned to thinking about what was the built environment look like? What did these places look like? And especially at that time, it was a, um, a period of time in imagery in which so much of the imagery we were looking at about African-American life and black life in America was geared towards urban, urban experiences. And so I was really drawn towards the fact that it felt like these kinds of images were missing um, to a great extent from the discourse about uh, the way in which black life was had had unfolded and continued to unfold because these were active and still um, in many ways vibrant communities. Um, we'll go to the next one, thanks. And in addition to all of that, um, during this project, I came across archival material and that and I gradually figured out a way to incorporate or fold the archival material into the project. These are just two images of school children in a, a town that no longer had a black community. And there's a whole story to it. But the point of this being that I began thinking about how would I incorporate uh, archival material into my work. And so all of that was taking place during this decade. We can go on from there. Thanks. And that led to, and now that last image was of children in front of the Port Republic School. And now that eventually led to a project called Schools for the Colored. And next slide. And schools, by the way, I'm, we'll talk a little bit about this slide and we'll look at some others, um, is just on the verge of being completed as a limited edition um, book um, being produced by um, Evan Baden out in uh, Portland, uh, Oregon, and we've been back and forth. We're very close. I think this weekend he's going to start running the press on it, um, and it will be available, and I'll make sure I, you know, have it connected to my website and everything, and it'll be the first time, and there's a wonderful essay that was written by Walter Greeson, who at the time was at Monmouth University, he's now at McAllister, um, and is really a renowned um, African-American scholar, and he writes about black schools in New Jersey and the history of black schools in New Jersey. And this is Brooklyn, Illinois. And this is what started me. This is this, uh, the school is no longer extant. And I was interested in it because I was uh, drawn to the idea that this black town, this is a black town, it was an incorporated town, had um, within its boundaries, a small white population, and they had to 
uh, build a one-room school and hire a white teacher for the handful of white students that were within this um, municipality. I mean, it was a sizable municipality um, at the time that this was done. So I really turned towards the idea of the schoolhouse as being really representative of our anxieties about race. Um, and it was a way of looking at it in the American landscape, all of those things that came from the first project. And we can go through the next couple kind of quickly. There, there are large institutions like this one, Christmas Attics in Indianapolis, um, small, basically one room schools. This is in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Um, this is a remnant of a school in Pennsylvania, in, and it was a black coal mining settlement um, in Pennsylvania. And then uh, this was the only um, state-run boarding school for African-Americans in the North, and it was here in New Jersey, the Bordentown School. And it's the size of a small college campus um, and today it is um, under the juvenile justice system, but that's a long conversation. I won't even start it. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll go on from there. Uh, just to have a sense of that variety and almost simultaneously with that, I had a chance to travel twice to Israel to a African-American expatriate community um, in the Southern part of Israel. Um, and they are part of a group uh, known as the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem. Um, they have been, they were originally established here in the United States. Um, and in about the late 1960s, early 1970s, they made pilgrimage to first to um, Eastern Africa and then to um, into Israel. And they have said they've been in Israel since about 1970, 71. Um, and it is to me a remarkable community. It is a small black town. And at the same time, it was a way to look at and think about um, the way in which African Americans have constructed not just identity, but also community, not only here in the United States, but outside the United States. Go on. And I wound up slightly after that working on a project here back in New Jersey called Seven Steps to Freedom. And it was a underground railroad project put together by um, uh, Jim Turk, who was formerly the um, uh, curator of history at the State Museum, but at the time was um, the cultural affairs officer for Salem County. And he put together this really remarkable project, which included actors creating, you know, reading scripts at various locations throughout Salem County, telling the story of African Americans in Salem County. And I was brought in to create some uh, images to um, represent and interpret those places. This is the Goodwin Sisters home. And at the time, although just recently, I noticed the I think it's the church in Newark was just re recently added to the National mm -hmm. Park Service um, Network to Freedom at the time though, and I think until this church in Newark was added to Network to Freedom, this was the under only underground railroad site that was part of the National Park Service's Network to Freedom in New Jersey. Um, and it was very well documented. Um, they There were many letters between the Goodwin sisters who were Quakers and William Still in Philadelphia. And as they passed people along the Underground Railroad. So we'll just go on. And this actually was Colonel Johnson's home where across the street, he held in an enslaved person while simultaneously on the other side of the street, the Goodwin sisters are helping enslaved people pass through Salem on the Underground Railroad. And it was important to me to sort of talk about how those things were happening simultaneously, that we don't, we often think of, enslavement in a very linear way and we forget that there were many people uh, free people of color long before the civil war uh, not just in the north but also in the south and then at the same time there were many people that remain enslaved in the north well into the 19th century um, coming up to very close to the civil war okay. and this was a 
uh, book owned by the Goodwin sisters. It is the, um, and I never can get the whole title of it. And actually there are various versions of the title, but it is the history of the abolition of the slave trade um, by Thomas Clarkson. That's my shortened, slightly shortened version of it. Um, and it's the book in which you can see the illustration folded and sort of sticking out there. Um, the illustration exists of the um, uh, way in which enslaved people were stored within the hull of a cargo ship. That's that black and white illustration that we've all seen, you know, many times. Um, and, and it was important to note that the Goodwin sisters were reading that. They didn't really want me, they hadn't, no, they didn't want me, they hadn't really commissioned me to photograph objects, but I was already working on this project manifest and thinking about objects. And so while I was working on the locations, I was also interested in those objects. Um, so we'll go on with some of these manifest images. And the, not the earliest, but one of the earliest images is this photograph of um, a unknown, uh, unidentified gentleman in Jamestown, New York, uh, possibly the lamp lighter for the community um, in the 19th century. And one of the things that struck me as I was starting this project was that I began looking at all kinds of material uh, as objects. And as you saw that, you know, the whole purpose of looking at the Clarkson book was to see it as an object and none of nothing in the photograph provide you any of the information about the content of the book. It's not a reproduction of the image that's so famous. It's not a reproduction of any of the pages, even the spine that has the title would just sort of see this physical thing. And the same thing was starting to happen to me with images, photographic images that I began um, with this one actually annoyed that I couldn't really you know, get rid of this reflection at first and then realizing it was this reflection that started to make it clear what the physical nature of this tin type was, that it had been bent and it had these characteristics that were interesting. And then I remained interested in the physical nature of the photograph as well as many other objects and go on to some more stuff. This is Frederick Douglass, an amber type of Frederick Douglass. This was done for Smithsonian Magazine for the opening of the National um, Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, this also was for that issue of Smithsonian Magazine. These are um, the dolls that um, the Clarks used um, in their famous sociological study that was then folded into um, the case of, for Brown versus Board of Education, looking at the preference that black children and white children would have when presented with a black doll and a white doll. And the, the psychological damage caused by racism. And this just graduation ring, the way in which all of these images are about construct, again, going back to that earlier comment about constructing a community, constructing identity. And the photograph has been an ongoing tool within black culture for constructing identity. This is a graduation ring. It's really tiny. Um, and it is at the, and I just, because I get a kick out of saying this, it is at, located at the Stir Museum of the Prairie Pioneer in Grand Island, Nebraska. One of my favorite names for an institution. Um, and this is at the Muter Museum. Uh, in Philadelphia, the College of Physicians. And it is um, just what it looks like, one of their collection of many skulls, that they actually don't have much provenance in terms of who put it in the collection and why the word Negro is written on the skull. But it was a te most of the stuff in their collection was for was teaching material. And so many of the objects, the bones and things like that, that are, are and other biological specimens were just placed in the collection, often without much inventory by individual faculty teaching in medical college in Philadelphia, and then gradually it evolved into a museum. So it's a fascinating, I find it to be a fascinating collection because of that sort of very vague way in which all this material came together. We can go on from there. And then I wanted to conclude 
with my work on Red Summer, even though the manifest work is currently my most recent work. Um, that's the, um, Michael mentioned the, um, the Peabody Museum uh, fellowship that I'm working on right now. Um, and in fact, I'm heading out on trips starting next week again. But I wanted to return to uh, Red Summer, which has been a project that was really important to me because of all the things that have, um, because it's just been on my mind a lot lately after uh, the shooting in Buffalo. And so um, one of the things about that has happened in American history is the degree of uh, in, intentional, purposeful forgetting that has taken place, you know, over the years. And there's certain moments that we have held on to. Um, and partly those moments are typically held on to because they contain great stories of white heroicism. And so even though the Civil War was fought over slavery, there's all kinds of stories of white heroics built into that on on both sides but around 1907 and there it's very hard to narrow this red summer is a name um, that is assigned to the year 1919 i extended that idea to 1917 to 1923 to sort of look at a broader period of time i really could have easily gone back to 1898 or and continued to come forward in terms of this period of time at the beginning of the 20th century in which white communities descended on black communities with a tremendous amount of violence. Um, and uh, the death toll was really um, astonishing. And because there's really no white heroes in this, we really haven't heard very much about this. I mean, this has just started to come back in the past few years. Um, there was a, a pretty pretty good book done um, about 2012 or so um, that was somewhat comprehensive. And there are a number of other small books that have been done on individual attacks throughout the country. But the, the overall um, awareness of this, I mean, I can't tell you how often I was exhibiting the, this work and talking about this work when people, I encountered people for up until the most re in the past couple of years, it's become more um, people are more aware of it, but for a long time, people were just unaware of this period of time. And um, certainly it was something that was hard to find in any general history book about American history. Um, we can go forward. This, that was um, East St. Louis. Um, this is uh, Elaine, Arkansas. Both of these are places where Depending on the scholarship, it's evolving. This is uh, the scholarship on Elaine is still evolving today in terms as it is, for instance, with Tulsa. And so today, you know, the um, death toll is probably in the two, three hundred range, depending on, you know, who, who you're who, who's counting and how they're counting, but literally hundreds, if not thousands of people descended on this small town um, as a result of a group of black farmers wanting to get better pay for get better prices for their um, products. Um, and, um, and that I should just say that, um, and this is a, this is a remarkable um, newspaper that I've been um, reading uh, Isabel Wilkerson's cast. And one of the things that she um, talks about in terms of making, drawing the parallels between castes in India, caste in, um, uh, with Jews and Nazi Germany, and caste with regard to um, African Americans and Black life in the, in the United States, is the degree to which trivial and inconsequential mistakes on the part of the lower caste can result in catastrophic punishment from the upper caste, right? And so in that previous image, the farmers, you know, that wanted to get a little bit more money for the grain that they were selling or the cotton that they were selling was considered an inexcusable breach of the caste system, the hierarchy, you have to accept what you're being given. And in this next one, this is another one that's remarkable because aside, so this is Longview, Texas, 
And there is an article there, The Great Battle of Longview, Texas, and it's about the running street battle that's going on in Longview, Texas. The Texas Rangers had to be brought in to confiscate guns from on both sides of this in order to quell this ongoing battle that erupted between blacks and whites, started by um, uh, members of the white community. But what I love about this newspaper, and also hate and is painful, is that the big headline is that this guy wants his marriage annulled because he claims that his wife has some Negro blood in her veins. And so that's big and important and the top piece in this newspaper and below it, it's like, oh yeah, well, and there's this, you know, on there's this small war going on in Longview, Texas at the same time. In the next one, we're almost. And this is Tulsa, of course, and I don't really need to say much about Tulsa. But I can say that that I, I, you know, don't have to. I can say that if you don't know the Tulsa story, the Tulsa story starts with the mistaken impression on the part of a woman in an elevator when a, a young black man rushes and jumps onto the elevator, and she feels like she might have was getting assaulted, and because of that mistaken impression, an entire community was wiped out, um, even though. At some point before the violence began, she retracted that story. Um, and um, But that didn't seem to help because all of the animosity had been built up. And it's interesting, I think this story parallels the Nazi Jewish story very well because it is the resentment of the white community for a financial and economic success on the part of the black community. Uh, that was um, considered and often referred to as Black Wall Street at the time. And it was that resentment that led to this annihilation, not just the punishment of one offender, but the annihilation of the entire uh, community. And so that is um, a remarkably parallel thing. I thought Wilkerson tells a story in cast that I thought was um, quite powerful in that um, early in the 1930s, the Nazi party was meeting and beginning to set down the, raw, the laws that would restrict Jews. And they turned to America to look at what the laws were that restricted African Americans. And they thought they were unreasonably extreme, <laughs> that they would never be able to use such extreme measures against the Jewish population uh, at the beginning. So it's, it's, it's a telltale that the Nazis thought we went too far. Um, and Wilmington, Delaware, I think that might be about at the end, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, and so that's about at the end. And I know I went over there for a minute, sorry <laughs> about that. Um, and um, thanks. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I forgot to mention that, uh, please feel free to type uh, questions and comments in the chat and uh, what, what, whatever we have time for at the end, we'll, uh, we'll try to get to. And now I will hand it over to Aaron. You should be able to uh, unmute and share. All right, get started. In yours. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> No, <laughs> you may have to make me a co-host. I think because you restarted it. Yeah, that's right. I did restart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Okay, I'm good now. <laughs> right, wonderful presentation. Wonderful. I came to learn today. Uh, just Thank you. <laughs> grateful to hear you speak about your work. Um, and I want to reiterate what you said as well. I, I really admire your work and. Um, I'll speak about that a little bit um, in my talk. And um, Michael, thank you for the invitation. And thank, to, thank you to Heather and everyone else who uh, made this a possibility. I always love to be in conversation with, with other artists, uh, and especially you, Wendell. So I'll go ahead and get started. I'll just talk about two bodies of work. Um, Yesterday Once More, which looks at my work in the Arkansas Delta. And Black alchemy, which deals with a bunch of things, but I'm, I think through my talk, you'll see different connections in my work. It's really just one long ongoing conversation is the way I like to think about my work sometimes. Um, 
so uh, you'll hear me read a little bit from my notes uh, just so I stay on time and then I'll speak freely at times as well. So some of the first images that I was ever exposed to uh, when I took my first photo class maybe 10, 11 years ago was images of Robert Kappa's uh, Omaha Beach uh, when they stormed D-Day. Um, and so these images made me, these were the images that made me want to keep the camera uh, in my hands. Uh, I don't know in particular what it was about them, but I remember distinctly uh, at that moment, I knew I wanted to be um, uh, use the camera to, to, to communicate. Um, and then from there, I went on to study photojournalism at Ohio University. Um, I intended to work at newspapers, um, but after um, pursuing that and after discovering uh, Dr. Jeff Willis's book, Reflections in Black, uh, I took a different turn. Um, and that's even how I found out about um, other uh, Black photographers documenting um, Black communities, including Wendell's work, uh, Small Towns, Black Lives. And then also I happened to come across Latoya Ruby Fraser's work at this, around the same time. Um, I had been documenting my own community in, in the Arkansas Delta. And the feedback that I was getting from my instructors at the time was that uh, nobody would take me seriously. Um, in, in so many words, uh, because I was documenting my own family, that I was too close. But then seeing Latoya Ruby Frazier's work totally mm -hmm. just obliterated that idea just for the fact that I saw her present within her own work and documenting her own community. And then one of the uh, other reasons I started documenting the Arkansas Delta is because I came across Eugene Richards' work. Um, and I was flipping through uh, one of his first books. Um, about images in the Arkansas Delta. And I kept seeing towns that I grew up in. I kept seeing the town of West Memphis, Arkansas, which is where I'm from. I kept seeing these particular images here from Earl, Arkansas. And then you got people like Dorothea Lane visiting right. Earl, Arkansas. Where these were towns that I grew up in and visited frequently. This is where my great grandmother's house was. And uh, just within that moment, I couldn't believe that someone else would find my com uh, community that I grew up in important enough to point a camera at it. And then I started to look at myself and my own skill set. And I thought that I should point the camera at my own community and myself. And these just a few photos here. Hey, and um, I wanna just uh, pause you a second. Uh, people online saying they can't see your images. Oh, okay. Gary, that might be just you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think, I think that's you, Gary. <laughs> All right, sorry, Aaron, please go. It's okay. <laughs> um, and so these are just two images here. One of my uh, great grandmother's uh, former home and the current state of it uh, at that time. These Both these images were made sometime in between 2014 and 2016. And then this is just outside the sidewalk outside of the old Earl High School at the time. You know, uh, you can see the class of 1952. So they had this tradition of um, in concrete imprinting the names of the, the cohorts, the, the graduating co cohorts over time. Um, and then just to continue a little bit about Arkansas, um, uh, I moved back to Arkansas uh, three years ago. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of research since I've been here and I was able to come across these three photographers, uh, Jalevi Grice, uh, Rogeline Johnson, and Ralph Waldo um, Armstrong. And there's their portraits down there at the bottom. And I wonder, I always ask myself the question, um, what, what is the course of action that I would have taken on my photographic journey if I was exposed to these three photographers first, as opposed to Dorothea Lang and Eugene Richards images? Because one of the, the reasons I started documenting my own community was because I couldn't find uh, documentation that Black photographers were working in, in the area that I grew up in. But now since moving back and doing research over these last three, four years, I was able to find that identity within history. And so I think this comes up about the conversation um, to, to how do I present day uh, keep the legacies of these photographers' images alive and bring them to the forefront of hit the history of photography and then history of photography within the state of Arkansas. 
So just in making my series yesterday once more, like I had to look at history and I had to realize that I was not a William Eggleston, I was not a Dorothea Lange or even a Gordon Parks in my pursuit of uh, representational photos of people. I was more closer to a Ed Ruscha or a Zoe Leonard or a William Christian Berry. I'm operating in the same authority in my consideration of time and seriality. Um, that's why I feel like I never really fit in fully into journalism because uh, that idea that one photograph could represent an entire text or article just never satisfied me fully. Uh, so I always thought about time, um, how time moves over the course of one moment or of the course of years. And that's what I try to do. And yesterday, once more, as I focus on the Arkansas Delta, my family and their particular migration. And I often talk about that as a transformative process through understanding place, using the camera as a transformative experience or a transformative process. So the first part of the transformative process is changing an understanding of self, where I see myself in representational material from the past, understanding place through photographs. So these are just two examples of how I try to document particular things and how they unfold over time. First image here is of my granddad and my dad. This is one of my first images uh, that I captured them in the same frame, but how time changes, little did I know the next time that I would capture them in the same frame would be uh, my father going in, in the ground at his funeral and then my grandfather present there next to the casket, casket reflecting on the loss of his son. And then the second part of that is re revision and belief system. Re revisions and belief systems. How that representational material or, arch or archive, archive photographs inform the way I look at the world and how I identify in the world. This provides opportunities to relate to others going through the same transformative process. It also, also through using photography uh, as an empathetic mode of communication with others, sharing with the intention of new dialogue. So uh, serial or seriality uh, thinking about the act of creating a series of photographs referencing time, revisiting the same people again and again at different moments in their lives. Uh, this is the self-reflection we all have internally and oftentimes it's reflected in the family album. For me, I think it's the act of making these pictures a closer consideration of time, not only for me gazing at them, but how I'm changing, changing as well. Uh, moments in time are filtered through a photograph. Um, so this is two examples here. Um, this is like an outtake uh, of just a picture portrait of my brother. Um, not married, no family, no wife or anything like that. And then I look at him in this present moment at my grandfather's uh, funeral all the way into 2019. Now he is married. Now he has kids. Um, and how does that uh, change my relationship with him? Um, just how things change over time. Um, and then the third part of the transformative process is changes in lifestyle. After looking at place and identity through representation, how does that affect my lifestyle and the lifestyle of those around me? It provides opportunities to act on new perspectives, using photography to look at representation and how people in history are represented within photography, looking at the past and present simultaneously to create new speculative spaces. And these are just images here of my mom between 2014 and 2018. Um, and unfortunately, uh, ended up uh, losing her to a battle uh, uh, with cancer in 2018. Uh, so again, the individual relationships with the people are reflected in the portraits, but there's other information and other things happening simultaneously. And I'm using the camera to sort of understand everything that's, that's happening around me. Um, Another brief image here of my brother and my niece uh, within a specific moment of time instead of over uh, years of time. And then here's a, a picture of my Aunt Renee in 2014 um, in front of uh, my grandmother's home, the home that she grew up in in, in West Memphis, Arkansas um, as well. And then here is a representational um, photo of her in a, in a personal archive that I have of family images. Um, this image here, and it on the back of it, it's addressed to my mother, uh, which is why I have it uh, in my archive. 
Um, and then I, and, and how it kind of ties into black alchemy is these, these two images here. And I'll just read from my notes here. Uh, the first part I'm reading about this image here, and then I'll go on and kind of talk about this image and this image here. A photo, this is a photograph of my aunt at 21 years old addressed to my mother. In my opinion, a form, it's a form of communication shared between two sisters, which reflects on the implications of beauty. But most importantly, it, in this gesture between the two, they control the narrative of grace and dissemination, and particularly to their image. Therefore, resulting in my image, uh, my choice to leave the image face down in the act of preserving this gesture. Most likely, I'm referring and I'm speaking about uh, the narrative and the history of Sarah Bartman and the choice that she did not have in controlling the dissemination of her own image. So, most likely, Bartman would have never had the control over this this image, uh, her own image, and the dissemination of the images of her body, which is ref referenced here in this image. Uh, uh, this title of this book named Venus, and I can get into that a little bit later. Um, and so um, these two images here, again, this, this image of my, uh, this is my aunt as well uh, with her daughter, my cousin. Um, so uh, this is what I was speaking about a little bit earlier in, in the talk when I first began, like, it's really just an ongoing conversation. I, I really try to use archives to inform certain things that I want to say and projects just bleed over into one another in specific ways. And this is a triptych here uh, titled Moves from the Family Archive, and I'll just read a little bit about this. When I first started Black Alchemy, I used photographs of prominent figures such as Martin Luther King Jr., and I still do, uh, just with more intention. At the time, I was given feedback that it was too quick of a read. The image of MLK was too heavy of a burden for my practice but I never really accepted that internally. From a suggestion, I began using more unrecognizable figures. In the case, this is a photo of my aunt Renee and cousin Alicia from the late 80s or early 90s. They lived in New Orleans and, in, and my aunt would always send for me and my brothers in the summertime to come visit. I think I really responded to this image because they did live so far from everyone else at the time, even before I had been born. They had each other and this image really defined this, that for me in particular. I always wonder what other people think about this image since they don't have any connection to the people present. Does the knowing, does the not knowing really do what I want, want in the work? So this is an example about um, uh, another way for me to contextualize or define black alchemy is to say that it deals with how photographic images circulate. It deals with the, um, the topics of photo technologies and creating photo sculptures and installations. It deals with topics of representation, reproduction, and the photographic object. It's a studio-based approach to still life photography, all under the umbrella of abstraction. Uh, these particular things merge together. Mm -hmm. And this is just a set of images that, that show how Black Alchemy first looked in my studio when I was a student at Rutgers in terms of putting an image on a wall uh, uh, with the mirror in my studio, literally photographic refle reflection. And then again, how images sort of, and another example, how images re recycle themselves and uh, thinking about time and loss and transformative process. Uh, I made this image here, thinking about Kerry James Marshall's paintings in particular, those paintings uh, that, that, that are the memento paintings from the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, here you have a draping velvet fabric in space, and then again, the recycled image from my previous series, Yesterday Once More, that I make about my family. So rarely do those images end up in Black Alchemy, but in this picture of my brother holding my nephew at our maternal grandfather's funeral, funeral I was thinking about the bond in this photograph, but also the bond lost between the family and my grandfather in a, in a specific way as well. So at the turn of the century, W.E.B. Du Bois compiled a series of photographs uh, for the American Negro exhibit at the 1900 Paris Exposition. He organized the images into albums titled Types of American Negroes, Georgia, USA, and Negro Life in Georgia, USA. At the time, Du Bois was a professor of sociology at Atlanta University. He was com committed to combating racism with, the, with empirical evidence of economic, social, and cultural con conditions of African-Americans. 
He believed that a clear revelation of the facts of African-American life and culture would challenge the, the claims of biological race scientists at that time, which pro proposed that African-Americans were inherently inferior to Anglo-Americans. The photographs of uh, affluent young African-American men and women challenged the scientific evidence and popular race, racist caricatures of that day and sought to diminish African-American social and economic success. So earlier in my series, Black Alchemy, my main goal was self-reflection, and I explored that in a literal sense through the use of mirrors in my work. So you see here in this image here titled Un Untitled Self, 2015 is the first instance where I physically show up in the work. In this image, my goal is to reinforce other key factors, the Black artists and the artists within the studio, along with references to geometric abstraction. In the mirror, you see in an uh, archived image of an, an African-American man from Du Bois's archive. And for me, why I chose it is that it immediately stood out to me because it was a sort of a stand-in for myself and other Black men in my life. Moving on to this other project that has become a book recently and is available through Visual Studies Workshop online bookstore. But this series here, um, There May Still Be Time Left, is a spinoff of the larger series of Black Alchemy, which is Black Alchemy Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Um, but I made this body of work after not having access to my campus on studio for about set, six or seven months during that first wave of the pandemic when everything first got shut down. So these are the images I made when I first returned to the studio. Um, and the intention for this work was to always make a book out of it. Um, and so, but there may still be time left is, is really reflecting on the, all the injustices and, in, and, and uh, inequities in our society filtered through my perspective and through my project Black Alchemy um, as a device to understand everything going around me. So I think what I was trying to say with the title is that hopefully we may still have time left as a society to fix all of these issues that are present. Um, and then this is another body of work that I made after that one. Um, after getting in the studio after all that time. So this was a uh, body of work was made in 2020. Um, and it was also just a continuation of thinking about all of the same societal issues through Black alchemy, but I kind of took a deeper look in, in the past. Uh, so in this book is fill, filled with like past archival historical references. And there's no text in this book except for one excerpt that I'll read from an essay by Charles W. Mills and it reads as follows. But how can race shape our being so profoundly? Well, think in general about what social divisions do. As finite creatures, we can never experience more than a fragment of the possibilities in the world. We have what could be called a life world bounded by social structure, culture, experience, and the social circles in which we move. The people we tend to hang out with, date, mate with, and marry. There are certain things that we will never do, certain experiences that we will never have because of belonging to a certain community. We build a life on a certain set of assumptions about how things are and what the world is basically like. And though, of course, we can read books and watch movies about the life worlds of others, and sometimes make conscientious, conscious effort to remind ourselves that the human experience is not uniform. It's natural that our own experience should have the most powerful shaping effect on us. A life world generates a sense of reality. And then to finish off the talk, uh, just two more slides. Uh, this is more recent work from Black Alchemy Volume 3. And I'll give a little bit of backstory, but for the sake of time, I'll just dive right into my notes. So I'm thinking about legacy and light, in particular, the legacy of Frederick Douglass, which I, I didn't really, I realized I didn't include any images here, but that's okay. But I'm also correlating that with technologies that are like facial recognition, uh, terms like data sets, and then also the idea of surveillance uh, and anti-surveillance patterns within our society. So this is uh, this image here, thinking about Niger Parks, is, think, is talking about Niger Parks, 33 of Patterson, New Jersey. So on June 30 of 2019, uh, he was informed that, that there was an arrest warrant that had been issued for him. And he was accused of shoplifting from Hampton Inn gift store in Woodbridge, New Jersey, and then clipping a police car as he sped off. But Parks said in early 2019 that he didn't own a car, and at the time he had never possessed a driver's license. So there was a solid alibi that he had. had. 
the police department was relying solely on faulty and illegal facial recognition software. So, um, and he had to go through this whole different thing to um, prove his innocence. And this is not the only one, uh, Mr. Parks is not the only person that this has happened to based on the biases that lie within technology like facial recognition and artificial intelligence that, that is embedded within this software. But this is a topic about privacy and technology. And I think about figures like W.E.B. Du Bois and I think about Frederick Douglass and how they use photography uh, and what they would think about something like this present day. And so here to just kind of expand on it a little bit more, there's a self-portrait of myself with an anti-surveillance pattern projected on top of my face. And so these patterns people usually use in textiles and things like that. Um, and these, these surveillance softwares and artificial technologies cannot pick up on these things. So it's a way to sort of subvert that technology that is so embedded in our society um, and that has these inherent biases um, built into it uh, that Again, that same story falls on minority communities. But this image is an uh, image I made of myself, and then I reprojected it into a dark room space to sort of continue that conversation about photography. And then I took what an example of a data set, um, what a data set would look like. So you would, you would, a data set that is composed of like, let's say a military base taking all of the, the military IDs that are in that, in that, um, in that, uh, in their computer's database and archive, and they will take all of those uh, faces and embed that into like uh, artificial intelligence software to teach the surveillance software how to see faces. And so that's just an example of what a data set would look like. You'd have like a realistic face and then like a secondary kind of face that is degraded and then it will on the third tier will go into like a 3d uh, model of the face um and then also here i'm this in this image title when everything is new i am sort of uh continuing that conversation about technology and software but also still thinking about uh abstraction and in that other title i'm thinking about other artists like leslie hewitt barbara caston and aaron o'keefe um, and their aesthetics and how my uh, work is in conversation uh, with theirs or the desire for my work to be in conversation with theirs. So uh, that's a lot of information and I can clear up and clarify anything in the questions. That is my last slide. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. So yeah, let's, um, let's see what questions we might have here. Okay. I didn't have a chance to check. Nope. Okay. So there's nothing in the chat. <laughs> if anybody wants to uh, unmute and uh, ask a question or ask a question from the, the gallery, we have a few more minutes. Um, could I, I just, I just want to say that I was so impressed with both of these presentations and I was struck by the uh, the use of archives and history throughout both photographers' work. And I wondered if each of the photographers would like to say a little bit about what they see as the, the future in terms of using archives and history in art. Good question. Aaron, you wanna go? You wanna go first? Sure, I can go first. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Gary. Um, I think for me, the, the future of using archives, I think, I guess for me, I think about archives um, and I think about archives in terms of like access, access to a particular time in history and then that history can inform our present. And then that, that past and present combining those two things allow us to imagine the future. So I think for me, a lot of why I, I use archives and maybe why I don't do as much daily journalism for myself in particular is that these archival images for me represent a lot of what's happening now. And in some cases, I think for me, <laughs> I kind of said to myself, um, I don't want to add to the saturation of images that are out there now. 
I really want to be particular in how I use the camera um, and, and what it is I'm trying to say. And for me, archives have been a refuge for that, um, for me and sort of my thinking um, uh, based on how I was using photography before versus how I use it now. Um, so that's kind of the conclusion I came to and how I think about it in, in the future. Because uh, it, it can just tell us so much about where we are now. And um, I just think we haven't looked at the past enough, um, which is why a lot of this stuff is ongoing. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you answer, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what, what's wonderful is that in some ways, my answer is almost um, identical in that the, and, and the way that I refer to it is that one of the things that keeps me active in the archive and keeps me active in bringing all of these kinds of materials um, into my work is the sense of folding time in the way that Aaron talked about and this way of bringing the past and the present into a shared space and that that space is particularly um, well suited for um, investigation and, and inquiry. Um, but on a more pedestrian level, I am really um, drawn to the process of gaining access to what institutions have held on to and what they're holding on to. I'm drawn to the process of pulling out of the past various narratives that inform the present, um, especially, for instance, in the case of what we just experienced with this massacre in Buffalo and thinking about those past massacres which have taken place all throughout the history of this country. And the and I'm, I'm fascinated by both this, this sort of simultaneous sense of shock and at the same time that comes as a result of having purposefully forgotten that we do this all, we have, done this all the time. It is the nature of the, 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 um, the society that, that has been built for us. Um, I, just to, and my experience going into archives has been just remarkable. I, the, the one thing that's very hard for me is often I'll talk to a librarian or an archivist or a curator about coming to visit and making photographs of things in the collection. And I, they often will say, well, what are you looking for exactly? And it's the hard, hardest question for me because what's interesting for me is seen through the internet at this point, like a database that I can go to and there's a description and there may even be a picture of the thing that they have in their collection. None of that is useful to me in the long run in terms of knowing whether or not I will be interested in making an image or be capable of making an image until I'm sitting in front of the object. And even then, until I'm back in the studio working with the image that I've created. So it's this long journey between um, seeing something. So at best, what is perfectly suitable for most scholars in terms of as a historian, I'm sure to say, okay, well, I want a, you know, uh, I need to have access to a copy of this version of Thomas Clarkson's, you know, the history of abolition of slavery. That's, you know, serves one purpose when you're just looking for the content. For me, it may have to do with so much more in terms of how that particular copy has existed in time and what does it look like today and what does it represent in terms of its journey that it's taken and then what can I do with it um, once I once I encounter it so it's it's a it's um, at the same time it's the same as what Aaron is talking about and at the same time it's a little bit different yeah you you and Aaron have that in common you you right. transform the original objects in right. your own ways right both by obscuring it in certain ways right. and detailing it in in very different ways where it had never been seen that way before absolutely yeah. absolutely Could i i, I want to thank you both for excellent responses to my question and i just want to mention that um I, I worked as an archivist for more than 50 years trying to save things uh, <laughs> and try to prevent uh, certain other people from just digitizing them and throwing the originals away because I, I always felt that the originals 
have an aura about them. Right. And they also have a potential use by artists as, uh, <laughs> and, and that we, we should try to save the originals as much as we can. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Um, yep. Is there yeah, a question from the audience here? Okay. Yes. And, and like, so I mean, is there like plans to sort of continue pushing what we do, what we think of our time? So the question is just kind of the last couple of decades and what's currently happening. Even like the audience and our students, like we can bring through some of the, some of the different documents that have I wonder, will that become archives sooner? Like will that mm -hmm. become archives? Mm -hmm. So the, the question is about the change of archives and, and it seems like the recognition of social justice in archives mm -hmm. as well and fairness and representation and right. will you be or will it be you do you think it'll be this right. continuation. Yeah. So I'll just start and then turn to Aaron is that I just very briefly say that yeah I actually don't have a time limit on the material that I'm interested in it so happens that the two things happen with contemporary material. And I've gotten some contemporary material in the Smithsonian. I have the uh, coffin, the ceremonial coffin that was used for the demonstrations when Michael, after Michael Brown was killed and a door from Katrina, et cetera. But the challenge in contemporary material is that it is so contested in some ways. And it is also often possessed by people that may still be alive. And so sometimes these collections don't really have permission to, you know, um, make it available right away. So there are some complexities in, in relationship to that. But even at the other end of the spectrum, and this is going on right now um, at Harvard, the, um, the Renty um, uh, images from Zeely, from the Zeely and Ag Agassiz, Gazis, um, daguerreotypes of um, enslaved people. Um, they they know, you know, the descendants know. Oh, like that's a picture of my ancestor. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's directly connected to somebody, and they are, you know, in the midst of you know a lawsuit over who controls those images and how they're how they're used and all of those kinds of things. And that's a that's a very, you know, complicated thing because of the circumstances. And it's not because it's a picture and it's a picture of somebody. It's be the, and I think this is interesting from a legal point of view, it's because of the circumstances under which the picture was made, right? So in a sense, a person who is not free to choose to say, I do not want to have my picture taken, has a photograph taken. And then that photograph becomes part of the archive, where does the responsibility fall in terms of rectifying the initial failing of that person to provide that permission in that way? Um, it's, and of course, Aaron's work in terms of thinking about facial recognition, all that work is done without our permission um, in general, right? <laughs> so there is all of this sort of, you know, put together, but of course, none of it equals being enslaved or even in a contemporary context, being incarcerated, because in a way that would be part of how we would approach images of the incarcerated are limited in terms of, you know, how they would be used or how you would have permission to use them. Um, the bodies, of course, are under tremendous scrutiny, you know, today. And so uh, the bodies from the move um, bombing and, you know, just the mere fact that they were lost, so to speak, you know, that and, and then not so much lost, but nobody really, it was sort of like, oh yeah, do we, do we have to really keep track of that? You know, that it was more than lost. It was more 
um, that casual dismissal of the importance of these bodies, which was, well, they're here or they're there. We're not sure where they are. Right, 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 right. And that's how that the motor, I mean, when you think about it, the material at the motor is that way. They're in the process of trying to repatriate a number of native people's remains um, to the extent that they can, again, because so many medical professionals just took this stuff for granted for a long time. Yeah, uh, Aaron, if you have a response, I'll let you do that as well. I just wanna say, because we did pass the 7.30 mark, uh, those of you who have to leave, thank you very much. This was our last uh, third Thursdays for the season. We'll be back in September and uh, a surprise announcement, we're changing it to uh, Tuesday talks. It'll be the second Tuesday <laughs> of the month. <laughs> TW right, Tuesday right, talks. <laughs> Tuesday. Tuesdays, <laughs> yes. Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> um, uh, just to give you a heads up, and we'll, we'll announce that and everything, but the format will all be the same. It's just that uh, we're going to move it to a different evening. Uh, Aaron, did you have a, a response to that question about contemporary what collections? Was, can you repeat it? Can the question be repeated? I couldn't hear it. Um, yeah. We're, um, it, as as there are as contemporary co collections are created, and there's a, a new recognition of sort of fairness and justice, and uh, who's represented in permissions and all those things, uh, have you come across any of those issues or concerns, or um, has that already uh, been a part of your work? Well, with surveillance, definitely, right? Yes, I um, I've had a few instances. I've had positive and negative. Um, instances working with archives, because some of the, the people that I come across within archives, who generally I respond to the faces, make the images, uh, uh, filter them through Black alchemy, and then I go back and get the history and the context of them. I, I think context is so important to have when you're working with archival images. Um, and so I've had people uh, say to me, oh, that is such and such relative. Uh, that's such a beautiful image you've made. And I've had people respond positively, but I've also had people uh, res uh, just in one instance respond to uh, the use of like an image of, of Frederick Douglass, um, thinking about how he, his intentions behind using photography and someone to respond uh, negatively and say, no, we own that. <laughs> I'm just like, I just do not think that that would have been Frederick Douglass's response if mm -hmm. he were living today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he would advocate for all uh, people, especially within uh, use, who are using photography uh, to sort of uh, work against and subvert these uh, these past historical uh, traditions of uh, uh, stereotypical representations, uh, especially of Black people. Mm -hmm. And then I think on the topic of archives um, and accessibility, kind of going back to what Gary mentioned um, and lastly was um, like the importance of preserving objects, um, but also the access to those objects. Not all archives are, are accessible mm -hmm. um, and all archives don't necessarily have the full context or proper narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, they carry a certain narrative, and then uh, some of them are not accessible to keep those narratives intact mm -hmm. <laughs> at the same time. So mm -hmm. you can come across a lot of stuff uh, dealing with archives. But again, I think um, in terms of like contemporary archives, like I see the body of work that I make, like Alchemy, as an archive. Someone, after I'm long gone, will come and make sense of that work. Um, and so that's that's kind of how I'm thinking. That's why I always talk about thinking about the future, using the past and the present to think about the future. Uh, what's going to happen to these things after um, they uh, come into um, contact with somebody else mm, yeah. many years well, from now? So that's kind of how I keep uh, try to keep my mindset uh, to think about. You are starting an archive, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would just, um, real quick, Aaron and Wendell, I just was thinking about, you pretty much answered my question because I was about to ask you, do you, do you see yourself, you know, do y'all see yourselves in the um, archives, right? And with that being said, what would you say 
you know, to the to the artist or to the person that's using your archive about your own work or, you know, the work that y'all used to, you know, um, you know, basically carry on on um, tradition. What would you say to that person? Well, if I start, I'll just start real quickly and say that I think that, you know, my experience is very similar to where Aaron just left off, which was the idea that this material is remains alive if you continue to, you know, kind of uh, revisit it and can reconsider it and recontextualize it in ways that even as artists, we may not be able to do at the moment, and that we move through this moment and hopefully at, it will continue to have some usefulness for other artists, for other viewers in the future because of whatever materials we've been able to gather and put into it. So, I mean, I'm, I think I'm in the same place than in the degree to what Aaron indicated. And I think that um, I, I'm trying, I, it's not that I try not to, <laughs> I try to work in the moment as much as I possibly can, but with the idea that I will not, you know, hold on to what, where it goes, you know, kind of as, as it goes forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll re reiterate exactly what Wendell just said. And um, I think how I think about it is um, a very similar way, but um, I think, you know, once the once the work leaves the studio, it's it's out of our control <laughs> in some ways. Mm -hmm. But that's why I like the book. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the object yeah. of the book. Mm -hmm. because you I think that's one area where the artist has control of the narrative mm -hmm. on how these things live on mm -hmm. and that's that one moment you can put everything into context and relate it to other things in a very specific way at a very specific time um and then someone else can utilize it later on but I I um yeah I it is out of control when it leaves out of our control when it leaves the studio uh, there's a lot of rigor and reading and researching that happens that that no one sees. Um, and you don't really get that in a gallery or a museum. Um, not even in a book sometimes. So I think through physically going through all that labor, physically and mentally, um, my hope for the work in terms of an archive is that uh, it can provide uh, some context for someone else or use for someone else. And then it just allows the conversation to continue on. Um, it just, I'm just trying to say with my images that uh, let's, let's talk about this past moment. Let's not forget about it. Uh, we're in this particular time now, but in, in many ways, a lot of the stuff from the past is still relevant uh, today. So I think that's where I kind of come from um, with my work. Um, I'm not in specifically in control of what happens to it in the future, but I am trying to make certain decisions uh, where the chances are likely higher that someone will find it interesting mm -hmm. and that it will live on. Um, different places that, a lot. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Wendell. I know I was just gonna say exactly to that, this archive we're creating today is also a vital aspect of that process, that these conversations, the conversation that we're having right now, the conversation that of Aaron sharing his ideas about his work and making some record of this that Michael has recorded and will exist is, is to me part of that process as well, that we, are able to do something that maybe in a way was very difficult in the past, which is to capture these thoughts at this moment in time um, between two artists and between and with the audience, and that that it also is added into this. Exactly, you, 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 I couldn't have said it any better. I, I think it is important that we did this in this moment and that it will live on. Uh, people need to know that we were in conversation 
people need to know that we know each other and are worth each other's work. And that's just the narrative of, of art history and, and photo history. Um, yeah, that's that's how I look at things. And I, it makes me very excited <laughs> and very, I'm very honored. <laughs> Preston, did, uh, did you want to jump in? Yeah, 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 don't mind. Um, yeah. Michael always knows you need to jump in, right? Um, <laughs> so um, I know looking at your both your work and listening to what you're saying about archives and stuff, do you, is, is there any connection for you all um, to like the work of um, uh, uh, Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum where like, like, like taking an archive as it is and like recontextualizing it? Sure. I mean, that in both, um, well, in many of these, pro my projects, that is exactly what's happening. And I'm very, I've been very influenced by, by his work and those ideas. In Red Summer, I'm taking fragments of newspapers and putting them with these contemporary images of the landscape where these events took place as a way of creating a new narrative between the past and the present, as well as, um, in particular, the Manifest Project, which is just traveling from one collection and archive to another and photographing these objects, and now bringing them out of those collections and into a new archive reliquary, which is this body of work and what it represents in terms of my attention and my the narratives that I want to that I want to create. I mean, this current project is manifest, but then it has the set subtitle, um, the um, 13 um, colonies. And so it's looking at these objects as they exist within the geography of the 13 original English colonies and what that might mean to think about objects that landed in the in those places. Yeah, I um, I guess I will respond uh, to that um, and just say, um, in particular, uh, from from my perspective, um, along the same sentiments as Wendell, um, um, can you repeat the question, uh, Preston? Sure, sorry, sure. Just went, sure. Yeah, yeah. Fire. No, no, no. No, is this uh, um, is there a connection between uh, you're thinking about your work and and like um, like uh, Fred Wilson's mining your museum. Fred Wilson, okay, right. yeah, that's yeah. what happened to me. Please forgive me. No, I no, no. Out. Oh, dude, I, I'm with you, man. Fred. I blinked out on the reference because I was so keen in on what Wendell was saying. <laughs> but uh, this is what I was. This is my response to. Um, sometimes when I'm using photography, I realize how limited it is. Uh, what what the image can do, but I like that challenge. But that's what draws me to an artist like a Fred Wilson, because it allows me to see the possibilities of things. And I think maybe how I would describe what, what Fred Wilson does, you know, he has these particular, um, maybe this particular definition of like mining, um, mining the museum, critiquing the museum from within the objects that are already present. So even in that sense, that allows me as an artist to have a perception and to have the wherewithal and just the awareness that I don't necessarily have to pick up a camera to make art. I don't necessarily have to pick up a brush to make art. I don't necessarily have to touch clay to make art or whatever the case may be. It's, it's everything is available at all times to all people. Uh, that's one of my, I guess, universal ideas about art. Uh, so yeah, that's how I would respond to that question. So I, I think Fred Wilson is a great example of that. So, so we're gonna make this the, the very last question and, and if you guys maybe give a, a slightly quicker answer because we've got to have to wrap it up. Yes, no, <laughs> From yes, Kyle no. Lang. <laughs> <laughs> I can see various levels of abstraction in both of your works. I'm curious to know more about what inspired you to make that shift. Um, well, I would just say that I will 
the, for me, photography is fun. To, so the, the, the reason I hesitated, the photography is fundamentally an abstract medium. Um, and um, the, form, the formalism of an image is always um, an important part of the process for me. Um, but definitely, I, you know, I, I, can't, I, I have a hard time finding a photograph that's not also simultaneously abstract. So it, um, it's just sort of how I see photographs in that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Aaron? You repeat that again, Michael. I'm so yeah, sorry. No Don't worry about Zoom it. Zoom thing because I keep trying yep, to listen I know. and hearing at the same time. Believe me, I, at a certain point, I'll leave my body <laughs> uh, being on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> um, I see various levels of abstraction in both your works. What made you embrace that? Take that shift? Make the work? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I think for me, I, I couldn't mention it in the talk today just for time because it would have took me 20 minutes just to talk about it alone but for me I have a very particular relationship uh, to black artists using abstraction within art history uh, particular black particularly black painters and black sculptors uh, folks like uh, Ed Clark uh, William T Williams uh, Melvin Edwards uh, Howard Dina Pendel um, there's a very particular time in abstraction with, within the late 60s and throughout the early 70s um, and what they went through um, because those particular artists were up against things coming out of the Harlem Renaissance and the black arts movement and then the predominantly white art world at that time. So they were not accepted by either side uh, because you had one side saying, or oh, you're painting lines, shapes and squares, you're not down for the cause. And then you try to enter the predominantly the predominantly white art world and they won't accept your work because of the way that you look so uh, and then there's other perceptions but for the sake of time i won't get into that right now but what those artists represent for me is, is because a lot of those artists are still making now uh william t williams and melvin edwards just had a show together in new york howard and pendel just had a big a few shows in new york over the last two or three years so they are my contemporaries, but at the same time, um, the fact that they are still making and receiving recognition now shows their resilience. Um, and that is an example I can't overlook. They allow me to be an abstract artist and explore ideas about identity in this time. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do without being aware of what the, the context of their, their work and everything that goes along with that. That's a, that's a much longer answer I could give. That was give, a great answer. <laughs> but that's, that is my particular relationship to abstraction. I just happen to majority of the time use a camera to express those ideas. Yeah. Well, thank you both very much. This has been amazing, as I knew it would be. Thank you. Yep. And uh, we'll be back in September, everyone. Going to take the summer off and uh, repair the walls a little bit and paint this place a different color. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Yeah, thank Have you so much. Thank you.